Hello everybody, this is Conquering History Games and welcome to the start of a brand new campaign here on the channel. I'm very excited for this one. This one was uh, chosen via poll by uh, by, a poll by members of my subscribers in the community tab. So if you haven't already, be sure that you're always checking that out because I do semi-frequent polls up there, sometimes letting people choose which campaigns I'm going to do next. And the winner by, let's see, I don't, know what it, I don't know what it is now if you go check, but it's been pretty consistently 65% of the vote. Uh, the Teutonic Order is going to be played because, of course, you got to do something in the Baltics. The whole nor new Northern Crusade mechanic uh, has been started, so we uh, is, is been implemented in the game, so we're going to be doing that. And, of course, the Teutons won. I kind of thought there would be uh, a few more votes for the Pagans because a lot of people would figure, oh, you know, isn't that more of a challenge, you know, play the Pagans and try to hold off the Teutons, but apparently not, and hey, that's fine. I like them both. It's a lot of, there's tons of fun to be had here in Crusader Kings 2. Now, as per usual in uh, just about all of my Crusader Kings 2 campaigns, we are going to be going to a custom start date, so to get us a little bit closer to where we need to be, we are going to come down to the age of the Mongols and then go forward a little bit more than that. So we're going to head to the year... Pardon me, 1225, January 1st, and right here we have it, the Teutonic State under Hochmeister, aka Grandmaster Hermann. Uh, now, the Teutonic Order did not have its beginnings here in uh, the Baltics, they actually were in other areas first, and I'm going to talk about that once we go in there, but you might be noticing... I'm not allowed to play as a holy order. If I go down here, I can click this play button all day long. Whoops, close that. I can click the play button all day long, and it won't allow me to do it. It'll just switch me over to somebody else, because uh, it's grayed out. I go over here to Kumania, because that's what's behind it. So how the heck am I actually supposed to play as the Teutons? Well, it's actually relatively simple. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go over here to the King of Poland, Les Zeke, and uh, we're not going to do Iron Man mode, because, you know, I... <laughs> I've had I've sometimes had issues in the past where maybe my mic cuts out halfway through an episode and then I can't re-record it because I'm on Iron Man mode so I can't go back to a save file. So no Iron Man mode. Besides, there's no achievements available yet anyway, and I don't even know what the achievements are going to be. And we're just going to leave. Uh, I guess we'll turn Sunset Invasion off. We're already going to have to deal with the Mongols. No need to uh, to get that going as well. I usually keep it on in my games just because I guess I'm a sadist or something. Uh, but, uh, some people like it, some people don't. We'll have to see what happens. Anyway, we're going to look through here. I think at the bottom is the new Holy Fury stuff. Yeah, we will allow... Okay, Fourth Crusade uh, events don't really matter because it already happened. We'll keep the Children's Crusade on. Of course, we're going to want the Northern Crusade to be happening because it's an important part of uh, this, this area of the world that we're going to be playing in. The Reconquista will keep going, and then Child of Destiny will also keep going because I'm not exactly sure what that does. So... Here we go, the Teutonic Order, but starting is Poland. So all I'm going to do, another reason that uh, there's not going to be any Iron Man mode, is because we're going to go over here and tag over to him. There you go, it was that easy. We're now the Teutonic State, Hochmeister Hermann of the Teutonic State. Now, before we get started, uh, for those of you who have never watched my channel before, I do study history and I like to give a little bit of historical context to the games that we play, particularly when I'm playing uh, in Crusader Kings 2 because I feel that people don't actually know as much about the medieval world as they understand. So sure, somebody might be able to tell you all about, for example, the 1066 start and William the Conqueror and then a little bit later Basilius down in the Byzantine Empire and all of that. But, you know, we're in the year 1225. We're, we're almost 200 years later, like we're about give or take a couple of years 260 years later the landscape of Europe has certainly changed although the Holy Roman Empire endures and so first first off let's let's just go a little bit over the Teutonic state here and the Teutonic order of knights now they were uh they were initially a branch a german branch of the knights hospitaller which kind of did carry over in their uh in their banner and they were down here you know helping fight uh the wars against the muslims being part of these christian states that had developed in the middle east following the first crusade however it's a uh, you know it's the year 1225 basically the middle east is becoming a dead end for these crusades not much is happening and uh hawkmeister hermann who uh was from he's actually from a noble family that's here i wonder if they're 
Let's see, there's Marienburg. Here we go. He's from here. Third and Gin. All right, so there's a different dynasty in charge, though, right now. It's not his family. But that's where he was from. He was a young aristocrat. And then via merit, because that was one of the... Uh, the nice things about the Teutonic Order is that was a that was an element of medieval society where you could actually rise through the ranks on the basis of mostly merit, uh, which is not something that you can find everywhere <clears throat> during this time period. So anyway, he eventually becomes the uh, head of the he becomes the Grand Master of the Teutonic State, and he says, you know what, we need to stop messing around here in the Middle East, and we need to look closer to home. We need to be thinking about these pagans that are beginning to encroach into Central and Eastern Europe. So if we go over here to the Religions tab. You can see here, for example, the Tengri are coming over here. Uh, you have the Ro Romuva, who are going to be mostly fighting, I'm sure, over here. Uh, so you got these pagan religions. They're like, ugh, uh, Orthodox Christianity. Might as well be pagans, right? Uh, the, we, we, we've got them encroaching into these areas. Now, the first thing that he tried to do when shifting uh, the order's goals were to focus down here in Hungary. And for a brief while, they had some of these areas around Carpathia that were given to them by Hungary. And I briefly considered uh, actually starting in that, uh, starting there. If I had gone back one day, even, I would have still been down here in Hungary. Or I think two days, actually. December 31st, I noticed the, the Teutonic State just disappears from the map. And then on January 1st, they reappear up here. So, so they moved from Hungary up here to Prussia in a day. Pretty impressive stuff. Uh, so anyway, they, they eventually, though, were expelled from Hungary, but when that happened, uh, they were invited not by the king of Poland, but by his duke, this guy here, Conrad of Mazovia, uh, to come over and convert the Prussians. And you see, the Teutons themselves were not Prussian. They basically, I guess you could say, would replace the, the native Prussians. But hey, you know, that's something you see consistently in world history. Go in into an area, kill the people in that area, say you are now that area, the, the, the true inhabitants of it, right? Uh, so, anyway, getting back to the Hawkmeister here, Hermann, he was, uh, while he was still Grand Master of the Teutonic Order, he served as a diplomat for Kaiser Frederick II here, um, and was a, apparently a pretty good one. For example, he actually arranged a reconciliation between him and the Pope, uh, not this Pope, right now it's Honorus III, but later on you've got, oh, he's got an heir here, that's Bernardo. Was it Bernardo? The one that becomes Gregory the Ninth. Uh, and he actually managed to achieve a reconciliation between the Emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope, which anybody will tell you is not a very common occurrence. And the Holy Roman Empire is pretty freaking big right now, as you can see. You know, they have southern Italy and stuff. They're, they're probably the most powerful force in the world, except for, oh my god, it's the Mongols. Yep, Genghis Khan himself has been running wild. He's heading west. I don't know if we're going to run into him personally. We might. Hopefully he's going to continue his way down here into the Middle East as he did historically. We're going to have to wait and see on that one. Uh, so, so yeah, as I was saying, with the context, the Mongol invasion is in full force right now. They're, they're, run, they're running down into the Middle East. Uh, meanwhile, over here in Anatolia, you still have the Sultanate of Rum uh, that has... Uh, occupied much of it still surrounded by several orthodox kingdoms though they've got georgia to their north which at this point is probably more powerful than these shattered scattered remnants of what was the byzantine empire is this a new music track i'm trying to remember where i can check the music i'm liking this track anyway uh <clears throat> they got armenia to the south the latin empire still exists currently under emperor robert it's a good time for the french uh, so they're the ones who actually hold Constantinople, and then across the, the Isthmus here is Basilius Ionis of the Nicene Empire, so they're not even technically going by uh, the Byzantine Empire at this moment. Uh, so it's going to be really interesting, as always, to see how these two are going to fight it out. And then you have these other areas here. Uh, like, okay, so Epirus here is actually owned by a Greekman, but Duke Guy is a Frenchman over here in Hellas. And yeah, I wanted to confirm Jeffrey over here. So these are all things that are that are remnants of the Fourth Crusade. These are the consequences of the Fourth Crusade that happened about 20 years earlier. Now, uh, continuing to just take a little, some quick peeks around the world. Uh, over here in... Uh, Iberia, we have King Fernando II of Castile, also known as King Fernando II of Leon. I'm actually playing him in a different campaign right now. You should definitely go check that out. I talk about him at length. But if this game's going to end up following a historical route, he's going to end up tearing it up down here uh, in uh, Iberia and really pushing the Reconquista further south, uh, very far south, although perhaps not completing it. But we'll have to see what happens. It could get interesting.
France is also looking pretty strong right now under King Louis VIII, the Lion of France, whose father was Philip II the Great, a.k.a. Philip Augustus. I also have a campaign where I played as him. That was a great campaign. Um, really, really happy about it. I'm really sad, though, that... Uh, yeah, it, it, actually, never mind, never mind. But, yeah. Uh, he, he's also... He was so great, he started a bloodline here in the game. So, bloodline of Philip the Great. Do we have any bloodlines, by any chance? Didn't think so. I just wanted to check real quick. So, uh, Louis the Lion, though, this guy was a really interesting dude. Could have been... And some may even argue he was, briefly, the King of England, even though he was French. Now, the reason for this uh, is, and, and I'm just I'm bringing this up because it'll be interesting to see how England and France fight each other, is uh, because, so Louis the, 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 the Eighth here was the child of Philip Augustus, uh, and during his father's reign, King John was in charge up here in England. Right now it's Henry III, he's only 17, but his father, King John, this is the one who you hear about in the Robin Hood tales and stuff, had a... Uh, signed the Magna Carta <coughs> as part of this struggle that was going on between the barons of England and the monarchy. King John was also having a lot of fights going on with the papacy. He was even briefly excommunicated before he swore fealty and like basically turned England and Ireland into a fiefdom of the papacy, all the while while he's losing uh, land to the French king down here. <clears throat> so, the bear uh, eventually the Pope and John start to get along again, and it's basically the Pope and John against the barons of England. And the barons actually ask Philip Augustus, the father here, for help. Now, Philip himself does not go, but he does send his son, Louis. Now, the important thing you need to know about Louis is that he was already a very well-respected warrior, a respected man, and he was already married to Queen Blanche of France here, but she's actually a princess of Castile, and the nephew of King John of England. So if we, uh, let's see here, where is it? I'm trying to find, hold on, things are getting a little confusing here. Let me try to find the relation. Yeah, here we go. Uh, her mother was Eleanor Plantagenet, whose uh, father was King Henry. So, you know, her siblings included King John and King Richard the Lionhearted. So that's how she was related. So he kind of had a pseudo claim to uh, England. And he, he ends up landing in England with an army, uncontested. John just runs away off to Winchester. He enters into London to cheers uh, from both barons and commoners. But the problem is that nobody will crown him because they don't want to offend the Pope. And the Pope was backing John at the time. And this is actually reflected where, uh, let's see, where is it here? I think if you go, where's the modifiers he's got? Oh, what? I was checking this earlier and I noticed, well, he had the crowned in a barn effect, which I guess he doesn't now. That was weird. I thought he had it. I could have sworn he had that effect. Crowned by Prince Bishop. Ah, well, you know, because now being crowned is an important part of uh, CK2, like like give it, getting bonuses and stuff. Anyway, the point is that uh, King John over here of England eventually dies while... Uh, you know, this Frenchman is holding huge chunks of England, like the south of it and the east of it in particular. And uh, <clears throat> then his son, Henry the Third, becomes king, but he's only like nine or something at the time. So his regent, William Marshall, starts to uh, fight against Louis. And they, he starts to concede things to the barons. He's fighting Louis. And eventually, King Henry is the one who's actually crowned by a bishop in, in Gloucestershire. So, of course, that's lending him legitimacy. And in fact, if we look over here, extravagant coronation and giving him more prestige and vassal opinion. So they've incorporated that into the game. And this all eventually leads to a series of battles between the French and the British on English soil, uh, culminating in the Battle of Lincoln in 1217 that ends any hope for Louis of uh, becoming king although louis wasn't there he was uh, fighting another siege so then louis down here signs a peace treaty in which he renounces all of his claims to the english throne even though he had effectively been king of england or at least half of it for over a year also we have down here real quick his son prince louis who uh would go on to be the only canonized king of france uh another interesting individual we might talk about him more when he comes to uh, power but I just realized it's been almost 15 minutes and I haven't even started in the campaign. But, you know, again, we're just we're just taking little glimpses at the world, giving some context as to what the geopolitical situations are. You know, obviously we have big like Novgorod over here. Denmark's looking particularly strong, things like that. But let's actually go check out what it's going to mean 
to, uh, to, to be a holy order. So let's take a look at our character here. He's a brilliant strategist. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Look at this. We've got 21 martial, 7 diplomacy, 7 stewardship, 11 intrigue, 6 learning, personal combat skill of 30 because he's also a crusader. He's a defender. Uh, he's brave, proud, cynical, but also patient. Wow, great character. Great, great start. Uh, we've got a few titles down here. Now, we are a holy order, so what does that encapsulate? Uh, we are the most pious followers of the religion, could join a holy order and attempt to defend the faith from outside forces, coming to the defense of any lord or lady who might be attacked by infidels. They are the stalwart protectors of the faithful. Their orders have strict hierarchies passing from one leader to the next within the order. So, <clears throat> I actually am going to read all these because I'm willing to bet nobody watching this video has ever seen somebody play a holy order before, so they have very specific rules. <clears throat> we can hold castle, tribal, fort, and hospital holdings without penalties. We can also build castle, city, temple, tribal, fort, and hospital holdings. But we cannot imprison subjects without special reasons. We cannot revoke titles without special reasons. We can revoke titles from holy order government vassals without objections from other vassals. So I think that just means within my own country. Other people like their family members and stuff might get pissed if they live outside. We can revoke titles from barony tier vassals without objections from other vassals. We cannot create kingdoms. We cannot create empires, nor can we usurp kingdoms or empires. We have no gender succession laws, and our other vassals will not object to vassal retraction. So, you know, we're pretty strong within our own order, but we can't create empires and stuff. A holy order government vassals will give max taxes and max liege levies regardless of opinions. Tyranny actions against these vassals can be made without objections from vassals of other governments. However, we cannot inherit titles. Uh, so we can't usurp kingdoms, we can't create kingdoms, we can't uh, inherit kingdom titles. Nor can we grant kingdom and empires to characters with a different government. And we can't receive kingdoms and empires from characters from a different government. So we can receive land. And if my reading of the Dev Diary is correct, that would be... Besides conquest, the main way that we could expand once we get into the Northern Crusade, we can become beneficiaries and things like that. Anyway, I've been talking quite enough. Let's create a treasury. I'm going to try to create a treasury. Let's choose a focus. I'm kind of old. I'm 63. Uh, but we're going to go with war. Uh, you know, get some get some bonuses from that. A special title, action possible. We're going to do it down here in Marienberg. What else have we got? Minor titles, category. I, I just like to auto-assign commanders. It just becomes really tedious after a little while. Uh, what do we got here? We got Wolfram. We got a lot of lowborn people, for example. Yeah, if we look here, expect to see lots of lowborns in uh, in our little state here. Uh, of course, Lithuania is to our east. You better believe that's going to be a target of ours, although I don't know if I want to go after them just yet. Uh, we're going to recruit a court physician. My guy is too good for me to not take care of him. All right, laws. Now, it's my understanding that they, the, the, the opinions aren't really going to matter for people. So what we're going to do is we're going to move up to uh, <clears throat> limited crown authority. We're already at high centralization, so that's good. And we'll switch it up to a higher feudal tax as well. Although we should hopefully be getting a lot of money coming in because Catholics are going to be able to donate to us in order to get piety and things like that. So hopefully we'll just have random chunks of money coming my way. All right, so descent. Let's go sow some descent down in Lithuania. We will train some troops up. Are we totally Catholic within our borders? No, we are not. Okay, so we must prolesse the size as quickly as possible. Can we go study some technology? Maybe go learn something from the Latins. See what they've got to teach us. Collect some taxes is always good. And there we go. And, hey, maybe we're going to actually unpause in this episode. There you go. We have it. Oh, also, I totally forgot. Oh, wait a minute. Faithful, prepare for war. Looks like we're jumping right into a crusade. A messenger approaches us with a letter from the Vatican, from the Vicar of Christ himself. He is asking us to prepare our men to fight against the heathens and infidels, to restore Christendom to the lost places of the world. The Pope wants to send our faithful Christian men against uh, Jerusalem. The region is held by the Muhammad Sult... Muhammad Sultan al Kamil Nasir al Din of the Ayyubid Sultanate, and it is time to return it to Christianity once more. Though the Pope wants to invade Jerusalem, a pious Christian could convince everyone to focus on another objective that is of more value to us. We can say our men are ready to Jerusalem, or I should consider preparing my men. See, I could spend the piety 
to uh, to change the target. But I think because I, I do like to try to role play uh, a little bit more. Herman has already decided the Middle East is a lost cause. And even if it's not a lost cause, we need to focus on the pagans closer to home, the heretics closer to home, the heathens closer to home. So we're going to say, I'll consider it. But we're going to back out of this one, probably. We got we got thing, other things to worry about. Uh, oh, yeah. So we have a designated regent of the state we could have. Is anybody who doesn't like me in particular, or somebody who really likes me, I should say, Let's get the mayor of Brandenburg. We will grant him, uh, let's see, wait a second. We're gonna, where is it, court unit? Yeah, we go, designated regent, we'll make it Wiggerreich. And we already got some technology points, sweet. Okay, your scouts report of a one-eyed man that recently arrived in Marienburg. The man referred to as Merunza the Wise by the commoners is apparently blessed with immense wisdom that he uses to both impress and help wherever he passes by by offering a significant sum of gold to this man. He would be willing to cease his wandering and take up residence in your court. Generous offer. Oof. 38.8. Hey, I need a court physician, though. And already we're able to get some technology advances. So we could go for Majesty. No, can't really go wrong there. Legalism. I don't need legalism. Usually I like to rush legalism as quickly as possible. And tolerance. Ooh, I don't know about that. Religious customs could be good, but it's not going to help us really. Let's go with a little bit of majesty to get that extra gain. And we now have the large feudal taxation law. So we're bringing in almost 10 a month as far as gold. Not bad considering how small we are. So, as far as declaring war, because of our situation, we can just go for holy wars. Of course, this means other pagans could join them, but it is a pretty good way to eat up places quickly. All right, what is this? Matters of life and death. <gasps> can I do the immortality route? Oh, man, this guy's really good, too. If I could make him immortal, that would be sweet. <clears throat> Matters of life and death. With age come wisdom they say or at least it may change the question we ask questions we asked you mutter to yourself you have had trouble sleeping lately more often than not while the rest of your court is sound asleep you find yourself staring at the ceiling you are getting older each day closer to leaving this plane of existence it is folly of course yet you are terrified you'll end up all alone like the miserable ulinix you've seen him skulking about a dark cloud over him you sit up straight in your bed this is ridiculous you're the hochmeister you have God on your side. Maybe your counselors could calm you down. If nothing else, it might ease your trouble sleeping. So this is my spy master. I'll end up all alone like him. So he's miserable. See, he's misguided, envious, deceitful, cynical, and depressed. Yeah, I don't want to end up like that. We will summon the council. Yeah, that would be really freaking sweet. Okay. <clears throat> A meeting of the minds. Your council conveys, and the faces of your advisors speak of confusion. Why are we here, my lord? It comes with a hint of concern. You sit down, and the suspense is almost tangible as you leave the question hanging in the air. Finally, you speak, and without disclosing much of your current nightly restlessness, you convey the message eloquently enough. I want to discuss the concept of life and death, and I want to look into everlasting life. They nod slowly. So what do you think? The spirit rises in the room as your counselors start to talk, some hesitantly, some gesturing wildly. They all have ideas. We could do a search party because we have high marshal, or I would rather not make any decisions on my own. They were hired for a reason. No, we'll have Wolfram do a uh, search party. Uh, your marshal will arrange a realm-wide search for any person in position of knowledge on the matter. He seems doubtful regarding the whole endeavor, but maybe a healthy dose of, dose of skepticism is just what their job requires. <sighs> Can you imagine the immortal Grand Master of the Teutonic State? Beautiful. Speaking of beautiful, this is one heck of a logo here. Uh, for the High Chiefdom of Sclavia. That's really nice. Oh, speaking of popes earlier, Pope has died, and we now have Sergius V in charge. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how this game plays out. Also, remember, Aragon has bits of France here, so I really want to see if France is going to end up unifying. Will they take on the Holy Roman Empire and try to turn themselves into an empire as well? We've also got about a year to join this crusade or not. 
I just don't know. Maybe if I get enough piety, but I doubt it. Enough that I could try to change the target, but it's a little bit expensive. All right, paying your passage. I'm not going to say I believe the stories, but we have picked up some promising information, my lord, Wolfram says. However, we could do with some more supplies if we are to journey even further. In fact, I would like to send word to hire scouts in certain more distant regions if we are to follow the leads and continue this <clears throat> mission. He pauses at the door, his posture strained. Of course, there are other ways to reach eternity, he sighs. When you open your mouth to respond, indignantly he interrupts you. I suppose the attitude comes with the job, master. My apologies. Your marshal exits the room, his steps growing fainter as you consider your options. Uh, I can send word to the whole world if need be. That's going to cost me 179.1 gold. Goodness. We could spruce up the armory to cheer up Wolfram, or he's right. I'm not a believer either. His mood will finally get to me, and I will continue looking without any... He'll keep looking without any special aid. Hmm. So I guess what he's saying is, look, you can keep looking for some hocus-pocus immortality cure, or you can become immortal by doing good deeds, or doing great deeds, so sprucing up the armory or something. Uh, I will send word to the whole world if need be. So we're already in debt. That's not good, but it's fine. Like I said, hopefully we should be getting money from uh, from a lot of people here. Yeah, it's going to be int really. I'm really curious to see how this is all going to play out. Your know, Russian, the Russian, the Russian culture has been created, of course, by now. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see who's going to win Orthodoxy or the Tengri under the um, Kumani. The Kuman, I should say. And of course, the Mongols, who knows what they're up to. In fact, they've just now attacked somebody. Looks like they're heading into Tibet, going after the kingdom of, Gu of Guje. A learned Jewish man has appeared at your court. He comes highly recommended in the arts of bookkeeping and administration. Already he has suggested several ways of improving the bureaucratic efficiency of the realm, and he could potentially make a fine steward. Indeed! How fine are we talking? Wow, 21. Mmm, he's an Israelite. I don't know, should we be putting a Jew on the council? We are a Catholic order. Hochmeister Ehrman of the Teutonic State, I have noticed you have still not pledged to the cross. As a faithful Christian ruler, I hope and pray you will reconsider your actions and join in the righteous war for Jerusalem. We can join. We can say we'll support it and even give money. That'll give us piety. Or I need time to reconsider. Uh... All right. <laughs> I suppose we could join and just not help. But if we support the crusade, it'll also give us piety. And it's not like I'm doing anything else right now. Maybe I could help. We could give it one last try. All right. We're not going to support. We're just going to stay in the middle. We're just going to pledge our troops. Uh, we have not chosen a beneficiary. So this is one another one of the new... <clears throat> things that uh, has happened, you know, they've, they've been sort of redoing Crusades. We've got about 50 days to go until it starts. But basically, I could choose a beneficiary to receive anything, um, uh, uh, you know, depending on how the Crusade goes out. It can get a little bit complicated, but basically, it's my beneficiary is the person who I want to get the stuff. Uh, I've pledged to join. Why can I not choose a beneficiary, though? I can contribute. I can leave... Oh, it's because of the recipient. So right now, I'm saying anything we pick up on the crusade, I want to go to Queen Isabella of Jerusalem here, who was, who's was who been queen since she was like born, pretty much, since she was a few months old, because her mother, the former queen, uh, died. Uh, I think it was, yeah, I think she, she just was too strained from childbirth and died shortly thereafter. And her father was not uh, able, was not eligible to receive it. Does he have leprosy? What is that face? You see it, right? He's got like all pocked... Anyway, so then Queen Isabella became queen very, very young. She's already only... Well, she's 15 now, so she got married. Yeah, she's actually married to the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. So, anyway. So right now, our stance is that uh, anything we pick up from the Crusade should go to her. But I could say I could pick a beneficiary, or I can say, why should I give my titles away? Um, I think we might just let the Pope decide. 
yeah, we'll, we'll just let the Pope decide for us uh, for right now. Or I could always change it up because you can see here I could just I could just change it any time for no for no real consequence. But uh, I will make that decision I think in the next episode. Thanks for joining me. I'm conquering history games. I know there was a lot of talking in this episode, but we're gonna get rolling. Obviously, the Crusade's gonna start in 50 days. But I'm very excited about this. I hope you all too all are too, especially those of you who voted for it. And even those who didn't, I think it's going to be fun. And, I, and you know what? I haven't even talked about the Livonian Order. I need to do that. And I also need to talk about Lithuania. But anyway, in the next episode, the pace is going to pick up. I will see you then. Please subscribe if you have not already. And be sure to click the bell so you're always notified whenever a new video is up on the channel. So you're notified about it. You all have yourselves a wonderful day. I'm Conquering History Games. And bye.